Welcome to our 12th and final class on the book of Ecclesiastes. During lockdown in the UK, and as some restrictions are being lifted. This class was taught on Tuesday, 16th of June, 2020, for the British Bible School in a Zoom class setting. The outline we've been looking at as we've been progressing through the book of Ecclesiastes is this one here. And we are now on the very last section, the purpose of life where Solomon will arrive at his conclusion. As you look back over the previous 12 chapters, we began in chapter 1 with uh, it's a theme statement that that's, goes throughout the book, where the teacher says, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. And we've seen that phrase or some form of that phrase almost every single chapter, and we will see it in chapter 12 as well. But throughout this book, Solomon is searching for a meaning in life. And he's examined every aspect of life that there was to examine in his day and age. Although having said that, these are things that people still try to see or try to establish as what gives them meaning in life. But we, like Solomon, end up at the same place. After each one of these, he says, this is meaningless. Often he added the phrase, this is chasing after the wind. The last few chapters, he has examined wisdom and foolishness. So we begin to see a little bit of, of uh, glimmers of light as he uh, leaves to examine some other things. He saw the as a whole, wisdom is better. Um, but the problem with wisdom is, although it's better, it can't answer all the questions we may have. And then we got to chapter 11, where we saw those glimmers of light at the end of the tunnel. And we saw in the last chapter, yes, we need to work, but we need to share what we have. That life overall is good, and we need to enjoy all of our days. But... And he said this before, keep in mind that we will have to answer to God. He will bring us into judgment. And we're now going into chapter 12, the conclusion of Solomon's search for a meaning in life. So we look at chapter 12. We're going to divide the section we're on, the purpose of life, divided into the two chapters, we looked at live wise lives in chapter 11 in our last lesson. And in our lesson this evening, we'll be looking at Solomon's conclusion. We're going to, he's going to arrive at what he believes is the meaning of life. We're going to divide this into two sections. Uh, the first section, the first eight verses, remembering God in your youth. Or I guess we could have expressed that, remembering God before you get old because that would work out well, as you'll see as we get into the text there. And then the last section, fear and obey God. So, let's sit back, if you have your Bibles open, and let's get ready to look at chapter 12, where he arrives at his conclusion as to where we can find meaning in our lives. What is it that makes life worth living? So we'll begin by looking at the first eight verses. The need to remember God in our youth. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble, the strong men stoop. When the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades. When people rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. When people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the street. When the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred. Then people go to their eternal home, and mourners go about the streets. 
Remember him. Before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel well is broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Derek Kidner opened this section in his commentary, The Message of Ecclesiastes. This is what he had to say. At last we are ready, if we ever intend to be, to look beyond earthly vanities to God, who made us for himself. The title Creator is well chosen, reminding us from earlier passages in the book that he alone sees the pattern of existence whole, that his was the workmanship we have spoilt by our devices, and that his creativity is continuous and unsearchable. Remember your Creator in your youth. We should remember our Creator when we're young. I think that's why it's important to teach our children Although there is no guarantee that they will remain faithful, I do believe that when they're taught right, that sticks with them throughout their life. The idea of remembering, it's not just that we should occasionally think about our Creator, but it's much more than that. Derek Kinder commented, To remember Him is no perfunctory or purely mental act. It is to drop our pretense of self-sufficiency and commit ourselves to him. Such, at least, is what in Scripture demands of man in his pride or his extremity. And I think that's what Solomon has in mind here. It's not just to think about him, but it's to commit ourselves to him. To forget the fact, to drop our pretense of self-sufficiency, I like that. Uh, Because we're not self-sufficient, are we? We've got to get rid of the pride and realize that we are reliant upon God. We need to obey God. We need to live our lives based on Him. And if we remember Him, that's what it's talking about. The Net Bible Study Notes uh, tied this in with the end of this chapter. The exhortation to fear God and obey His commands in 12, 13, and 14 spells out what it means to remember God. So this chapter is going to be about what it means to remember God. We need to remember Him. We need to get to know our Creator and to do this before trouble comes, before the day, difficult days of trouble come. Before the times we no longer enjoy pleasure in life, maybe even enjoy life itself. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come. The NIV translated this. By the way, depending on your translation, you may have a few different words here. The Net Bible, the emphasis was, um, not the Net Bible, but the ESV and the NASB. The emphasis was very much, to uh, remember him before the evil days come, which is the, what the literal word means in Hebrew, although its connotation is not wicked or anything like that. The Net Bible had, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. Uh, so difficult, trouble, evil. Uh, the contemporary English version put it this way. Keep your creator in mind while you are young. And years to come, you will be burdened down with troubles. In other words, when we're young, we're not. So I thought that was pretty good as well. If you're using the New Living Translation, it does not even attempt to translate the word for evil or trouble, but simply put, do this before you get old. Uh, well, that's, that's exactly what he's talking about. In the Net Bible Study Notes, if you're to look at, for the word that comes under trouble there, that this is what the note says. The adjective, ra, or evil, does not refer here to ethical evil, but to physical difficulty, injury, pain, deprivation, and suffering. So it's talking about these physical troubles that we go through. 
Danny Petrillo commented that a solid relationship with God should be founded in youth, nurtured and developed during middle age, and then solidified in old age. The elderly may be unable to develop a new relationship with God. Physical limitations may restrict them from giving their bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to Him. Instead, the aged ought to have fond memories of their dedication and service to God. This will provide a peace peace that takes away the fear of death and judgments. I think he has some good points there that we need to be able to have li- have this relationship with God founded in our youth so that we can build on that and it will see us through our old age. Matthew Henry wrote, this was quoted by Denny Petrillo in his commentary as well, Uh, Matthew Henry wrote, It's the greatest absurdity and ingratitude imaginable to give the cream and flour of our days to the devil and reserve the dregs of them for God. This is offering the torn and the lame and the sick for sacrifice. How can we expect God should help us when we are old if we will not serve him when we're young? And I think Matthew Henry had a good, good point there. Yeah, don't give the the best of our lives to the devil and just leave the dregs for God. Give the best of our lives to God and serve him all our days. There then follows in the text a list of things that goes wrong in our lives as we get older. It's cleverly disguised in Hebrew poetry. And we're once again brought face to face with our own mortality. He says, before the sun, light, moon, stars grow dark, and the clouds return. Seems to be referring there to our capacity for joy and happiness. You know, light as opposed to darkness. So before everything really gets gloomy, uh, we need to already have a relationship with God to see us through our dark days. Denny Petrillo commented, Once a thunderstorm has passed, there's hope for a period of clear skies. However, the aged do not have this optimistic outlook. One storm follows another. Clouds are frequently used as a metaphor for problems, sorrows, and anxieties. And doesn't he make a good point? As we get older, sometimes, especially our health issues, seem to be just one thing after another after another. I know of my own personal situation, as I get older, I'm finding more and more things. And every time I go to the doctor for a checkup, he identifies something else that's wrong with me. And I need to take some steps to correct that. One cloud after another. Although I would have hastened to admit that if we can correct these problems, we can get some clear outlook, a period of clear skies. Derek Kinder Uh, wrote that there is the chill of winter in verse 2. As the rains persist, the clouds turn daylight into gloom, and then night into pitch blackness. It is a scene somber enough to bring home to us not only the fading of physical and mental powers, but but the more general desolations of old age. So he's speaking here about what it is, what it means to be getting older. But I think this can well be seen uh, in, as, as we get older. We can see these things taking place uh, in our lives. But he continues, talks about when the keepers of the house tremble and strong men stoop. Uh, talking here about our heads, about our hands rather, and arms and our legs, the keepers of the house and stooping. Yeah, we grow weaker as we get older. And as the photograph illustrates often, we have to walk with a cane because we need that extra support. But then he talks about before the grinder cease, because they're few. Talking about before we lose our teeth, uh, before those who look through the windows are dimmed, before we lose our eyesight. Or, or our eyesight is dimmed, maybe through cataracts. Before the doors of the streets are closed and the sound of the, gr- of the grinding ceases. What's he talking about here? The loss of hearing. And then before birds wake us up, but their songs grow faint. 
Could be talking about their loss of hearing. Could be talking about that strange phenomena that the older we get, the lighter we sleep. Um, maybe it's talking about our voices become faint here as well. The Net Bible Study Notes had a footnote on this and said, Here it describes one of the frustrations of old age. The elderly person is unable to get a full night's sleep because every little sound awakens him in the middle of the night or too early in the morning. Or before we become afraid of heights or of what we hear going on in the streets. And this frequently happens to those who are older, doesn't it? I use this photograph here of my dad as he was getting older. Uh, dad used to be an avid walker. And he would walk for go out every day on his, his daily walk. I do the same thing, by the way. But uh, some incidents happened. And he was threatened by young people. And it scared him. And he became afraid to go out and walk. And the more I've been learning about dementia... And he did die of dementia and so much related illnesses and Parkinson's. Um, I, you, know, you wonder, the more I've learned about dementia, walking is one of the best things you can do to stave off dementia. And so, yeah, but as we get elderly, sometimes we, we become afraid of what's going on. Uh, Derek Kinder wrote that verse 5 adds new touches to the picture. First, by its observation of an old man's fear of falling or being jostled, now that he is unsteady and slow moving. Then Solomon talks about before the almond tree blossoms. So almond tree blossoms white. So this seems to be a reference to our hair going white. And here's some of my, my parents and some of my aunts and uncles. And we see lots of almond tree blossoming there, don't we? Uh, hair going white, beards going white. Some trying to keep their hair from going white. But nevertheless, white hair, that's what we look forward to in, as we get older. And that Bible not a, uh, note said of this, this is an appropriate metaphor to describe white hair that, that often accompanies the onset of old age. Indeed, it does. And then, of course, before our mobility becomes difficult, like a, drag, a grasshopper dragging itself along. And again, a picture of my dad, because as he got older, his mobility got very difficult, where he had to go to walking with a cane, and later on with a walker, and then later on, uh, I think he is possibly using a, a wheelchair. Um, so, before all that takes place. And Solomon also mentions there, before desire, before appetite can no longer be stirred. Um, you may be using a translation that has a slightly different wording there. Uh, some translations, the NET, the New American Standard, talk about the caper bearing. Here's is a picture of a caper berry becoming ineffective. And the caper berry shrivels up, it says. And that is literally what the Hebrew text says, although it probably means nothing to us. Uh, the caper berry was regarded as something that can both stimulate appetite and as an aphrodisiac. Now, I've never tried a caper berry. I know nothing about them. Uh, found this picture on Wik Wikimedia Commons. But uh, that apparently is a caper berry, and apparently it's edible. But these ideas that Solomon's putting forwards here throughout this section, I think are found in Barzillai's reply to King David. And you may be, may be thinking, who's Barzillai? If you remember, uh, when David had to leave Jerusalem because of Absalom's rebellion, he was helped by a man named Barzillai. And as he's returning to Jerusalem, he sees Barzillai again, and he invited Barzillai, because of his support, to move back with him to Jerusalem. And here was Barzillai's reply. He said, how many more years shall I live that I should go up to Jerusalem for the king? I am now 80 years old. How can I tell the difference between what is enjoyable and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats and drinks? Can I still hear the voices of male and female singers? Why should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? 
uh, very similar language to what Solomon's used here, and simply saying, before I get old, I'm so old, I can't appreciate anything that would go along with living in the king's palace. Now, the reason why these things are affecting us is that we're getting ready to go to our eternal home, Solomon says, and mourners will take to the streets mourning our death. And you know, when we reach that point, there's no chance of reversing our our relationship with God. There's no chance of reversing all these problems that life has brought and becoming youthful again. So what he's saying in all of this is we need to remember God in our youth before this life is over. And then he goes ahead to use some more metaphors about the ending of life. Before the silver uh, cord is snapped, before the golden bowl is broken. And the golden bowl, probably something similar to this bowl here, possibly contained oil for a lamp, and maybe it was suspended by the silver cord. And if the silver cord snaps, then the bowl falls and it would be broken. By the way, these are the silver cord, the the golden bowl broken, are ancient symbols of life, as well as the next few that he mentions here. So he's talking about before our lives are over, before the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the well, and before the water wheel is broken at the cistern or the well there. Um, Derek Kinder commented, and if this seems too finely drawn a picture of our own familiar selves, it is balanced by the scene at the deserted well, eloquent of the transience of the simplest, most basic things we do. There will be a last time for every familiar journey, every routine job. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? There will reach, there will come a point in our lives where there'll be a last time we do everything that we do, all the familiar things we do, all the familiar journeys we make. There will be a last time. And Solomon says we need to be ready for that. And we need to already have established our relationship to God before our bodies return to dust and our spirit returns to God who gave it. If you remember earlier, Solomon had questioned whether our spirits returned upward to God or not. Uh, Maybe he's resolved this dilemma and decided that they do. Then again, maybe he's just simply talking about the breath of life returning to God. Derek Kinder commented that, in other words, life is not at our command. The body will revert to its own elements, and the breath of life was always God's to give and God's to take away. Solomon is saying in all this, if death is all there is to life, then this life is worthless. It's useless. It's utterly meaningless. G.S. Hendry put it this way, his argument, like all things under the sun, has come full circle. And he repeats the theorem which he set out to demonstrate with an air of finality, as if to say, quod erat demonstrandum. Or, we might put it, QED. I never knew what QED stood for. Literally, those Latin, that Latin phrase means what was to be shown. And it basically means, I have proved what I set out to prove. So, he ends up again with, meaningless. That's where he started. And so he basically says, you know, if this, if death is all there is to life, life is indeed meaningless. Uh, Derek Kinder concludes this section by saying, so in verse 8, with this experience of the whole book behind us, and finally with this chapter's haunting pictures of mortality to enforce the point, we come back to the initial cry vanity of vanities, or meaningless, utterly meaningless, and find it justified. Nothing in our search has led us home. Nothing that we're offered under the sun is ours to keep. 
but we're forgetting the context. This very passage points us beyond anything under the sun in the words, your creator, and invites response to him. It also points us to the present as the time of opportunity. Death has not yet reached out to us. Let it rattle its change at us and stir us into action. And that, that, I think, is what Solomon is trying to do. So we move into the last section. Verses 9 to 14, he arrives at his conclusion. And he's going to tell us we need to fear and obey God. Not only was the teacher wise, but also he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end. And much study wearies the body. Now, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And with that, we arrive at the conclusion of the book. He begins his section here by looking just a quick summary of his reign as king. Derek Kinder says, We stand back for a moment to see the person and the process behind this remarkable book. The opening remarks point out the partnership between thought and expression, research and teaching, which the book itself has illustrated. What emerges is the story the author sets on his calling as a teacher. He is not the proud thinker who has no time for lesser minds. Rather, he accepts the challenging ideal of perfect clarity. And Kinder went on to say this man should be the patron saint of writers because he researches and thinks and tries his best to express it simply. The teacher, he says, besides being wise, he says, He taught the people knowledge. Thing was, he wasn't content to keep his wisdom to himself. He wanted to help as many people as he could. Now, we don't know how he did this. Perhaps public lectures on various subjects. But he was trying his best to impart his wisdom, to impart his knowledge to people. And he also wrote many Proverbs. You know, we have a book of Proverbs in, in, the, in the, uh, the Jewish scriptures, don't we? Uh, wrote many Proverbs. But notice he says he pondered, he searched, he set out in order many Proverbs. Or so, another translation, he weighed and studied and arranged them with care. And so he thought through what he set down as a proverb of life. Um, that Bible study notes commented on this this idea. He says, uh, quoting a fellow named Cohen, uh, he, he made an examination of the large number of proverbial sayings which had been composed, testing their truth and worth to select those which he considered deserving of circulation. That yeah, seems to be, to be what he did. Uh, so he pondered, he searched, he set ordered many proverbs, and he also searched to find the right words, which were also words of truth. Uh, More literally, he searched to find words of delight that are words of truth. By the way, we find in 1 Kings 4.32 that Solomon wrote 3,000 proverbs. And uh, I don't believe we have all of those recorded in the book that bears the name of Proverbs. Uh, Denny Petrillo comments on his communication ability. said he knew that communication is far more effective if the words are palatable. He did not wish to be abrasive or offensive in presenting the truth. 
Rather, his intent was to communicate in a way that would heighten receptivity. And I think Diddy makes a good point there. When we present the truth, when we present the good news of Jesus, we don't want to present it in an abrasive or an, an offensive way. And I think we probably have all undoubtedly heard presentations of Jesus that were offensive, that were abrasive. But shouldn't we be trying to communicate in a way that would heighten people's willingness to receive the message? I think that's what we see Solomon doing. I think there's a lesson for us that that's what we need to be doing as well. He goes on to say, the words of the wise are like goads, and their saying, collected sayings, are like firmly embedded nails. Now, goad, a goad is a prod. It's a sharp stick which was used to guide animals. Um, my grandparents had farms. They raised cattle. We had goads that we occasionally had to use when we were working around the cattle. So what's the saying to us? Uh, I think it's saying several things to us. I think it's telling us that uh, uh, the idea is that the words of the wise will prod us to do something. And maybe the idea that they're firmly embedded nails, that they're unchangeable, like nails are firmly embedded in a board. Uh, Hendry, in the New Bible Commentary, put it this way, Though acceptable, they have their sting. I quite like that. thought that was quite good. Uh, Derek Kidner in the message of Ecclesiastes, put it this way. Here then are two more qualities that mark the pointed sayings of the wise. They spur the will and stick in the memory. With this, Koheleth, master as he is, pays unwitting tribute to the greatest wisdom teacher of all, our Lord, whose sayings have both these marks supremely, just as they also excel by the criterion of verse 10 as pleasing words and words of truth. They marry felicity with fearlessness, partners which should not be put asunder. And if you're like me, felicity may not be a word that you use every day. I looked it up in the dictionary, and it means intense happiness. So pleasing words, words of truth, marry intense happiness with fearlessness, something that should always be joined together. But notice that these words of the wise, these collected sayings, are given by one shepherd. Now that indicates that these are words of authority. Now some translations translate or capitalize the word shepherd. So the question for us would be, who is the shepherd? The English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, both capitalize it in other words, their, uh, their idea is that it's referring to God. Most of the commentary, commentaries I've read on this take this view as well. But there are others that don't. Uh, the Net Bible, the NIV, which we read from earlier, uh, do not capitalize it. Knut Heim and the Tyndall um, Old Testament commentary on Ecclesiastes, the new one, uh, does not believe it's referring to God. Uh, they would possibly indicate it's referring to the king. Uh, I would tend to go along with ones. I think the, the one shepherd is God. Of course, our one shepherd today, we see that analogy that Jesus is our shepherd in the New Testament. I'm happy to go uh, with that idea, and I think that idea makes good sense there. But Solomon continues talking, and especially to his, he's going to now address his son. He says to him, be warned of anything in addition to them. Um, and then he goes on to say, of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Don't you like that? Uh, there's always something that somebody's going to write down in a book. The making of many books, there is no end. But well, keep in mind that books at this time were scrolls, not the type we have today. Uh, it took a lot more, a lot more space to store them, but nevertheless, uh, the making of many books is no end, and much study wearies the body. 
um, much study is exhausting, isn't it? So either there's a warning there. And I think we can relate to that if we've had to spend a lot of time studying for an exam or something or studying to make a presentation. Derek Kidner wrote, curiously enough, as verse 12 perceives, this may not suit us. We grow addicted to research itself, in love with our hard questions. An answer would spoil everything. I think there's a lot of people like that. They like the idea of research for the, the sake of research, not the sake of finding an answer. They like to ask the hard questions, not because they're looking for an answer. As Derek Kinder put it, an answer would spoil everything. They just want to ask the hard questions and stir up controversy a lot of times. I think we see that a lot during the current coronavirus. Uh, when I watch the, uh, the questions with the prime minister and the questions with the first minister, uh, the journalists often are asking questions. I'm thinking, why are you asking a question like that? Because there's no real answer to it. But maybe that's the point. Maybe they just like asking the questions to make somebody look a bit foolish. Anyway, Solomon finally gets to the conclusion. He says, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. All the evidence is in. He's reached the end of his study. So what was his conclusion about life? He says, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. See, fearing God and obeying him is what life is all about. Knut Heim translated this, God you shall fear and his commandments you shall keep. I like the way that's worded uh, myself. Warren Wearsby in Be Satisfied wrote this. The fear of the Lord is that attitude of reverence in all that his people show to him because they love him and respect his power and greatness. The person who fears the Lord will pay attention to his word and obey it. He or she will not tempt the Lord by deliberately disobeying or by playing with sin. An unholy fear makes people run away from God, but a holy fear brings them to their knees in loving submission to God. The remarkable thing about fearing God, wrote Oswald Chambers, is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. And I think Oswald Chambers had a good point there, and I'm pleased that Warden Wearsby quoted him in it so that I could see it. So we need to fear God, that attitude of reverence, and all, but because we love him, because we respect who he is. And as a result of that, we will pay attention to his word. We will obey it. Uh, you may have noticed that the word duty uh, is not, it's in italics in some translations. Uh, this word is not in the original Hebrew text. Uh, I would suggest it's probably not a word that even should be in there. Uh, I would suggest that rather this being our duty, at least the way we use duty today, that what he's saying is this is what our lives are about. This is the entirety of human life, fearing and obeying God. The New American Standard Bible is good here, by the way, because this applies to every person. That's the way they translated it. Knut Heim put... For this is the whole of every human being. I like that as well. Derek Kinder again comments, These two verses gladly give the human element its due in the words, For this is the whole of man. True, it is among other things his whole duty, but the Hebrew does not say so. It leaves this wholeness undefined. This, as we might translate it, is all that there is to man. But it is an all which stands in utter contrast to the vanity with which the book has been confronting us. Here at last we find reality and find ourselves. This is what life is about. And then there's the reminder as he concludes this book. 
for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. One thing this is telling us is that nothing we do is unnoticed by God, not, not even the things we disguise from ourselves. But I think one thing this also tells us is that God cares about us. God cares how we live our lives. And if God cares for us this much, think about it. Nothing in our lives can be meaningless. Uh, meaningless lives don't exist if God is part of it. This is the truth, dear Kidner wrote, that colors all the teaching of Christ, to whom no detail on earth could be too small to matter in heaven. An idle word, the death of a sparrow, a cup of cold water, the repentance of one sinner. It was this too that spurred Paul on to be urgent in season and out of season, and to finish his course with joy. We also see an implication in what he's saying in these last couple of verses about life after death. Denny Petrillo commented that in verses 13 and 14, Solomon said nothing that he had not been saying all along. His words provide a foundation for a balanced life. Men should enjoy living, but enjoyment must be tempered by recognition of God's presence and judgment. It is a testimony to the inspiration of this book that these truths remain as relevant and powerful today as they were 3,000 years ago. As G.S. Hendry concludes, he says, So we may say of the last words of Ecclesiastes, Spirant Resurrectionum. They foreshadow the resurrection. And so ends Solomon's quest to discover what makes life worth living. A worthwhile life, Solomon says, is one spent serving God. I would like to think that this shows that Solomon came back to God at the end of his life, having been led astray by his many wives and their idolatry. I'm sure we could add our amen to what Solomon wrote here. In Derek Kidner's message of Ecclesiastes, he had an epilogue uh, that he entitled, What Are We to Say to This? And to keep it brief, he said, as the book was brief, he quoted a few various writers through the ages. I want to share a couple of these as a conclusion to our study. And a confession of Augustine was this. You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless till it rests in you. I think that's very good. Uh, That shows us that, yeah, our lives are to be centered in God. God made us for himself. Uh, A prayer written by a chap named William Laud says, Grant, O Lord, that we may live in thy fear, die in thy favor, rest in thy peace, rise in thy power, reign in thy glory, for thine own beloved Son's sake, Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that what we want to do? Fear God and keep his commandments. Live in his fear, die in his favor, rest in his peace, rise in his power, reign in his glory. For Jesus. And finally, we have that we have an answer to the cry of meaningless that we've seen throughout this book. It's written by the Apostle Paul. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Meaningless? Well, life without God is meaningless. But with God, death has been swallowed up 
in victory. Let nothing move us as we give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because anything we do in the service of the Lord is not wasted. Let me mention just, just a few lessons we can learn from chapter 12. There's more I know that we could list. Uh, from the, be the, the beginning of the chapter, we so much need to help the young get to know God. Uh, as parents and grandparents, be teaching our children. Help them to know God early in their lives so that they can live long lives in His service. And as we have some knowledge, some Bible knowledge, maybe we get some wisdom. Share it by teaching others. That's what we need to be doing as Christians anyways, is sharing what we know with others. Of course, we need to center our lives on fearing God and obeying Him. Realizing, of course, that judgment is coming. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this series of lessons. Uh, next week, um, with the, in the British Bible School, we're beginning a new series of lessons. They, too, will be posted here on YouTube. So I hope you will follow those as well. There will be four new studies starting up. And so uh, we look forward to possibly you joining us for our next series of lessons.